Shalom. I'm Rabbi Arthur Wasco. I'm director of the Shalom Center. Uh, let me say in advance, you can uh, read what and, and see uh, graphics uh, for many of the explorations into Torah as it uh, affects our own lives, um, especially our political, social, and ecological lives at the Shalom Center's website, which is the T H E Shalom Center dot org. The Shalom Center dot org. Uh, and today I'd like to take up the uh, Torah reading for this week. Uh, the central element in it is the story of the golden calf, the uh, kind of primal act of idolatry. Uh, in biblical tradition and it reverberates again and again and again for several thousand years. The story begins in chapter 32 of Exodus by saying that the people got frightened because Moses was up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, for so long uh, they felt abandoned uh, and frightened and they demanded of Aaron, uh, that he make them a god. Uh, so Aaron collected their gold earrings, poured them into a vessel, heated it up, and sculpted the calf, the golden calf, which had been one of the symbols of divinity in ancient Egypt, which they were used to. And they said, wow, the God that brought us up from slavery from the land of Egypt, since Moses, who had done that work, had disappeared. So I thought, why was Moses up on the mountain so long that the people got so frightened? What was going on up on the mountain? And I went back to look at the conversation that the story tells between God and Moses up on the mountain. And a big hunk of the story is not the uh, regulations for sacred daily life and practice, uh, but the description of what's called in the Hebrew, the Mishkan, the place of the presence, the shrine, the portable temple uh, that the people carried through the wilderness, how to make it. God goes into great detail. The voice tells Moses the, uh, the gold, overwhelmingly gold, and silver, and copper, and uh, uh, different colored, uh, uh, very brightly colored purple, and scarlet, and so on, uh, cloth, um, into great, great, great detail. And it takes a long time. And that's what took a good hunk of the time that Moses was up on the mountain and the people felt abandoned. What if the voice had said, look, make a shrine uh, for my presence. Uh, be sure there's a slaughter site. Be sure there's a place to bring uh, uh, bread and uh, matzah and pancakes and fruit and vegetables, uh, the food from the land um, that you're going to go to live in, all that, make sure they're wonderful colors and wonderful textures of different kinds of cloth uh, for linen, and so on. And now you go and figure it out. That's, that's the basic stuff that I want. It would have taken about 15 minutes and Moses would have been able to be down the mountain much quicker and the people would not have gotten so frightened. So I wondered why does the story describe the voice of God, the divine voice, going into such great length. 
<laughs> what occurred to me uh, was that in some ways the voices, the story is describing Moses, sorry, not Moses, God's own golden calf. Gold and many other things, but that obsession with describing every little detail is the way you treat an idol, not a uh, divine uh, possibility uh, that the people might make themselves. They did end up making it themselves, but the, to a very, very precise description. God's own golden calf. That feels a little weird, more than a little weird. And it reminded me of a story that's in the Talmud, the rabbis, uh, about a thousand years later, uh, described uh, that some of them decided to hunt for the evil impulse, the Yetzir Hara, that made for idolatry. Uh, they thought if they could find it, they could kill it, and there would be no, no more idolatry in the world ever. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So they hunt, and they hunt, and they hunt. And they finally find the evil impulse that gives rise to idolatry, they found it hiding in the Holy of Holies in the heart of the temple. Huh. The two stories have something in common. They both suggest, they hint, they more than hint, that there is a great danger that you might turn what is really sacred into an idol. that you might say, not like Abraham, you can argue with God about whether to save 50 or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10 decent people in the city of Sodom, rather than destroy the whole city, including the innocent people in it. Arguing with God, no, you don't argue with an idol. You can argue with the living God. Uh, you can wrestle with the living God. That's what Jacob did. And uh, what came was he changed his name or the, the universe changed his name from Jacob, which means a grabby heel, to Israel, which means the God wrestler. Israel is supposed to be a people that wrestles God. So you can argue with God, you can wrestle God. Uh, an idol, you can't do that because an idol is dead and it turns the people who worship it into dead beings, deadly beings and dead beings. So it's a serious question. What makes something sacred? into an idol, how, it, how would you treat it that makes it an idol instead of sacred? And I think there are several things. One of them is you never argue, you never criticize it. So for example, uh, the Muslims who responded to what they thought was a desecration of the sacred soil of Saudi Arabia because the US put military bases there during the first Gulf War who were outraged by that desecration, decided to revenge it by killing about 3,000 people, totally innocent people, had nothing to do with the decision, put military bases there. And the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center in New York City, that's idolatry, killing 3,000 people for something sacred makes what's sacred into an idol. Uh, in the Catholic Church, when people who knew about child abuse by priests um, kept their mouths shut uh, because the church was so holy that you didn't want to criticize it, uh, that they didn't want to criticize it, uh, they had turned it for them into an idol from something that was sacred and doing good work 
in many, many ways, maybe not every way, but many ways, uh, they turned into an idol by keeping silent when lives were being ruined uh, by their silence, as well as by the actions of some priests. And in the Jewish community, people who think the state of Israel is so sacred that you can't criticize its government's acts, even when it oppresses Palestinians. Uh, and you must not criticize it or you'll be cast out. And that's idolatry. Uh, so it's the real question. How do you avoid falling into idolatry? I think part of the answer is you remember that even what's very sacred can make mistakes and they have to be criticized. Uh, and what's sacred is uh, a sacred being, a God or a sacred institution that you can argue with and criticize, even radically criticize. That's what Abraham did when he said, shall not the judge of all the world do justice and accuse God of planning injustice? It's what Jacob did when he said, why is the world set up in such a way that to get who I was intended to be, to get to be that deep person, I had to rob and steal uh, the birthright from my brother. This isn't just me. Why is the world set up like that? That's God wrestling. And it's what made him a sacred pursuer of truth instead of a grabby heel. So the question out of, I think, today's, this week's portion of the Torah is, what about each of us? What is sacred to us and how do we preserve its sacredness by treating it seriously and critically and not just shutting up when it makes mistakes? How do we distinguish between what's truly sacred and what might become an idol in our own lives. I think that's a very important teaching of Torah, one of the central teachings. And I'd leave you to meditate on our own, your own, our society's own um, danger of falling into idolatry. Be well. Shalom. Again, I'm Rabbi Arthur Wasco from the Shalom Center. You can find our website at the Shalom Center, starting with a T H E, the Shalom Center.org. I welcome you to explore what you find there and to join our weekly um, uh, Shalom reports about the world from the eyes of Torah and of, about Torah from the eyes of the world. Be well.